Um, I think everybody knows a lot about Intel. Can you first start off with telling us a little more about Startup Nation? Yeah, uh, we're definitely less known than Intel. Uh, but uh, we are an NGO that uh, is very independent. Uh, and the only thing that we want to do, actually only two things we want to do, is to make sure that Israeli technological innovation makes a bigger impact on the world and that Israel stays uh, innovative leader uh, for the next uh, 10 and 20 years. So that's, that's our own goal. We do not uh, charge for anything we do. We, um, we are fully funded by philanthropy. We don't take money from governments. And our goal is to promote the ecosystem. We gather information. We, um, we derive insights. We connect large corporates um, and uh, NGOs and governments to Israeli innovation. We, uh, we publish uh, Startup Nation Finder, which Amir Shvat was one of the founders early on of that platform. It basically uh, aggregates all the in innovation in Israel uh, under one roof. I strongly uh, recommend uh, looking at it, about 60,000 visitors a month. Uh, and we also work with the government uh, on policies and uh, promoting sectors. So uh, one of our sectors is Industry 4.0, um, Yariv uh, is going to hosting um, speed dating with some companies that we brought. Um, so we, we do a lot of different stuff, but with those two goals in mind. So um, now coming back to you, uh, uh, I have a long history. I used to work for the Prime Minister of Israel as economic advisor, and uh, I have long history both with Mobileye and with Intel. Um, and so tell you the truth, when uh, I learned that uh, Intel acquired Mobileye, uh, I was pretty disappointed. And uh, the reason I was disappointed is that I sort of thought about uh, Mobileye as the new coming sort of champion of Israeli high tech and sort of big uh, shining star, and then suddenly, suddenly Intel comes, uh, comes in and just snatches it. But then I talked to Amnon and, uh, and uh, Ziv and uh, Maxine on, on Intel side, and I realized that it might be actually a blessing. Uh, and the more I think about it, it the more I, uh, I think that it is, uh, it is a blessing with important uh, uh, ramifications for Israeli economy and Israeli startup scene. So I wanted to, since you, you've been very um, deeply involved in that transaction, can you tell us sort of what led to it and what, what was Intel thinking um, about this uh, acquisition? Yes, so um, I, it was it's something that uh, actually considered taking a look at for you know a couple, about, maybe about 15 to 16 months before the transaction was actually consummated, before we even engaged with Mobileye. Um, and it really started with you know deep kind of vision and, and trying to build some strategic logic. Because a, a lot of times in large companies, I feel like acquisitions are um, a an investment thesis is built around a company. Um, instead, it's really more, in this case, how we thought about transformational growth, and then you know, in, in whether or not Intel would want to play in the autonomous driving sector, and if so, how. Um, and then based on that, well, how, do, how, did we, how would we do that? What's kind of the deal roadmap of how we think about who we might acquire, where we might build internally, where we might partner, where we might invest? And, I remember very distinctively, um, you know, and this might even been actually almost two full years, we had a different strategy officer and we had this group within our internet of things that was starting to talk about autonomous driving. And you know, really took a look at just like, let's look at some of the raw fundamentals of how the amount of compute that was going into a car was really starting to get to the sweet spot of Intel. Um, and, and helping kind of pull away from some of the like, old burdens of, well, we were in the automotive business, so we got out, so what happens if we, um, you know, we have to be committed this time? But really kind of starting with, okay, what was Intel known for, compute? Um, how do we actually go kind of drive that, and is this something we wanna go play in? Um, so really started a lot of discussions and a lot of dissension within the company um, and, and some of the senior leaders, which I thought was fantastic as it goes to show like you're actually on the leading edge of something with for trans transformational growth. Uh, because if you're waiting to read it in a Gartner report or some other research, you're actually too late to kind of you know, help kind of shape the industry and drive the economics. So it started there. And then you know, we started looking at, well, wh wh 
what does it actually mean to win? I remember this discussion very distinctly with Brian Krasanich, our CEO at the time, where he's like, well, I want to win. And, but there we had three different leaders. I'm like, well, what does winning mean to you? And it turned out, you know, there was like three different, you know, answers I was getting. I'm like, okay, before we actually go to all of our constituents, our board, our investors, our employees, we need to be really clear on what is the vision and what is it we want to go do. Um, and then mapping from their vision, strategic logic, and then economics, because in the end, we are a public company. We need to return to our shareholders. We need to show that there's real some, real some economics in this. And you know, at that point in time, like we, we didn't really have a full conviction of vision. Then can actually thank one of um, um, BMW, one of our you know, customers, who started bringing Mobileye and Intel together and said, look, you know, I hear what you each are saying you can go do, but you don't, you don't each have it yet. I need the two of you to partner and work with us. And so by, bring, by BMW bringing us together and forming that partnership, I think it also really gave a sense of you know, both Intel and Mobileye to understand what we could each bring to the table. Um, and kind of break down some of the you know, barriers that might have existed in the past. You know, and then it really all came down to timing. Um, where um, I'm, remember we had a September board meeting and you know, the board was pushing um, the executive team on what else we could do for transformational growth. And was like, well, why aren't you thinking about something like Mobileye? And Brian was like, well, we have, and we're not quite sure how we can make the economics work. Um, and then we kind of dove into it again, and I think by having a better understanding and looking at where the inflection of compute was going, we saw there was a really good timing, because and, and all deals just like marriages, it all comes down to timing, and finding that great intersection um, for where we can drive the growth. Um, one thing I want to maybe just continue to add in about, which I think ties into like the Israel inside, we also took a very different approach to this. This was not a, you know, Intel knows how to go do this. I mean, we had some different, you know, components and technologies we were bringing into the car, but we really looked at Mobileye as the, the overall leaders of kind of what they had already dro drove within computer vision and combining the brains and the eyes for, for simplistic terms. And we want to do a reverse integration. And you know, went to Omnon and Ziv and said, look, you're the leaders in this. You're the, you have driven this vision so far where we can help support. We'll show you what we have. You take what you want um, to help kind of drive it because um, also kind of back to economics, you know, Omnon and Ziv are very, very focused on driving you know, profitable growth. Um, and I think that overall we've had like a really good marriage there where um, continuing to drive and scale the business profitably. So Intel, uh, John mentioned that, that Intel is very, very important for, for Israel on a variety of ways. And Intel is important no less for its approach to how it uh, works in Israel because it's very different from majority of multinational companies which basically buy a company or buy a few companies and keep an R&D center and take all the other um, activity outside of Israel, which if you push it to its extreme is a highly problematic uh, way of, uh, for, for, for Israel. Intel is very integrated, uh, has very integrated operations. It mm -hmm. has uh, fabs, it has uh, it has R&D centers, it's all, all kinds of activities, and now Mobileye adds to that. It also, it, you also invest in, in companies and help them grow with, with equity investment. So I, uh, I have two questions. How do you manage this, first of all? And what can you tell other uh, multinationals that are maybe considering doing that? What is the value that Intel gets from having all these pieces in, in Israel? It's over 13,000 people are working into, into your offices and, and fabs uh, every day. Yeah, well, so what's really interesting is I think Intel has very much embraced that we're a global company. You know, even though, you know, headquartered in the US, you know, more than half of our employees and half of our revenues are, 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 glo are global and outside the US. You know, with the number of employees, it's over 10% of, of all of Intel, right? And for a small, for a small overall like, geographical area. Um, but I think it's really kind of embraced that about where do you bring the real strengths of each of the different kind of cultures and um, access to resources and talent um, to bring it together? There's certainly 
you know, an integration and a, you know, a loss that you get of not having everybody be co-located. But I think Intel has really figured out how to, how to manage that and really embrace and respect versus saying, you know, we're a US company and so the US is gonna win. Um, that's, not, that's not the approach at all. I mean, I think that um, the other thing that we've done is you know, by kind of embracing those different cultures, I've also said at times, like, we've got a new product we want to develop and we don't know exactly which is going to be the best. And we've kind of separated teams and had, like, you know, dueling products um, internally, which that's going to happen in the external marketplace, but we might as well, like, in the end, have, have, have the winning product, um, or maybe that's going to be some combination thereof. Um, but I think I've really kind of embraced, embraced and kind of figured out how to work. Um, from a multinational, you know, kind of ad advice, um, I, you know, I think here it's I think really good just to understand kind of the benefits and really create this, um, you know, people will talk about kind of, you know, inclusive type of cultures, but it is one where, you know, everybody is, is the points of views are sought out and heard um, to kind of drive that overall value, and I think that's what's really important. And Intel, by the way, is a very important for, for, for Israel because it also sits in various places. It's in Jerusalem, it sits in Haifa, it sits in the, in the south. So it has, it has importance to, to more regional rather than, you know, many, many companies locate in Tel Aviv. So that, that has an additional aspect. Um, it's, it's an interesting thing. So the, these, these acquisition of, uh, of Mobileye, uh, Intel appointed former Intel CEO in Israel to guard Mobileye from undue influence by Intel. And at the same time, her job, Maxine Fussberg, is her job is to also navigate Mobileye within Intel. Mm -hmm. So this is, can you talk a little bit about it? Because it's an interesting approach. Yes. So, you know, I've had, um, I think with Intel, I've acquired about 45 companies for Intel. Um, of all different sizes, from small to very large, and the one thing I've seen, people are like, great, they're on board, and they just, you know, people, the enthusiasm can bombard, and then for a new company, it's, well, wait a second, who should I be listening to, and who should I not? Um, how do I navigate through? I can't even do my do like, support my my base business if I'm taking all these different meetings. So we have over the years really. Um, evolved our integration model, you can never say it's perfect uh, because it's just there's every, every deal is different, every integration is different, but that's how we manage them uh, to make sure that we don't just have a you know, clear model to say, here's how we handle supply chain, here's how we handle corporate services, here's how we handle HR. We really look at each company to figure, okay, what do they need from Intel, what do they not, and then how do you think about phasing that in over time? You know, in the end, right, an acquirer does need to get um, other kind of value of having everything be all under one house, but you don't have to do that on day one. It doesn't have to be on day 90, and some things you can kind of phase in. And, you know, even watch this with some of our other larger acquisitions of like the sales model might be very different. And, you know, software sales versus hardware sales and how we manage that with kind of Wind River and McAfee and then even the Altera acquisition. Um, so we really took that different approach. How then the other thing we've put in in place is this like entrepreneur in residence. I mean, somebody who is very senior within Intel, who knows who to go to and who not to, how to find the right resources. Um, and we, we've had these kind of, we've, we, they've been called different things in the past, whether, whether you know, now it's entrepreneur in residence, might have been a business transition manager. If we put that in place now for at least the last six or seven years, and it really is incredibly helpful in helping that new company navigate because we're a massive organization, and you know, like, and this was like for Amnon to be able to say, okay, Maxine, here's what I need, and and Maxine, having been at Intel for 30 years, would know, okay, I know who to go to, and I know how to get this done, and you know, again, like hide hide what's all like. The, the really messy closet or the messy room, like that's okay, it's all look nice from the front, we can go find this. Um, and really be able to help negotiate even like those different resources of kind of who really needs what um, has been incredibly helpful. So I think being that kind of shield and block and managing those systems, because again, for us, like number one value in most of the acquisitions that we've done um, is like the existing base business and you do not want to mess with that. And then being, being able to 
Now for Mobileye and Omna recently spoke um, to our executive team uh, uh, when it, a couple weeks ago, really showing about how the power of Intel has really helped propel Mobileye. Uh, and you know, in select areas where you know he wouldn't have had access to some of the same compute and technology, but then, and, but by bringing it in under one house, we now can have a better overall scalable solution, um, and and do that more um, in, in a better economic way. So I think that's where you know you don't have to force feed something in, but really thinking through where do you take the best of and leave off what's not needed. You, you, you in the Intel Capital invest, like you said, in many small companies and you make equity investment, not just acquisition. The majority of people sitting here are either VCs or smaller companies. So how should they think about working with Intel Capital um, on, on be, seeing you as an, as an investor who can promote them and actually connect them to things like you said with Mobileye, with or without acquisition? Absolutely. So, I mean, Israel is also, from an Intel Capital equity perspective, uh, one of our, I mean, our leading leading sectors. I mean, the amount of money that we put in place. I personally invested seventy-five million dollars in Israel last year, um, in in a couple company in a couple companies, uh, and you know we have a local team there um, that I think is very well integrated with um, with, with you all. You know, Intel Capital um, from the equity side is we've we've shifted our our um, investment investment focus or markets and more like fine-tuned it in the last you know year where you know, there have been previous times where we've had to really make sure we had a business unit who was very much engaged with the company you know we've really shifted that to be much more pathfinding and let's get engaged earlier on frankly there's better overall venture type returns by getting engaged more early but we are pathfinding even hedging against some of the internal things that Intel is doing um, and you know, we're, it's, you know, Israel for us has been very much an opportunity with, with investments in artificial intelligence, uh, in and around autonomous driving and computer vision, um, AR, VR um, as well, and then now even in the blockchain and fintech. So it's, it's actually one of our most important areas. The, I mean, I, frankly, I love the companies that I'm seeing um, coming in from Israel. It's, it kind of, I find it kind of interesting that in the last um, two years, even though I'm based in the US, like all the deals I've done have been in Israel. Uh, and because there's this, the pace of innovation, the strong talent, um, and, and real desire to like drive scalable businesses um, w with a real thought of where are, you, where are you building a company that's gonna be a standalone company becoming public? Where are you building a company that is really a technology gap fill integration into one of the larger multinationals um, or kind of giving yourself kind of that, um, the optionality between the two? I mean, I think really kind of clear focus and um, the, the, um, the co-investor group has been outstanding. And uh, maybe the last, we have maybe a, a minute. Um, uh, what is your prediction uh, or Intel prediction regarding autonomous driving? Is it 20 years away? Is it 10 years away? When are we going to be? Well, we stopped? already have some great cars on the road. Um, that, but I think you know, like in safety for us is is uh, number one. And um, you know, as, as Amnon um, and Shai have kind of published their papers on um, the RSS model, um, of like how, how you can really mathematically um, you know, design a system to ensure, ensure overall safety. I think that you're gonna, I mean, I heard, heard one of the earlier panels talk about commercial first. I do expect that you're gonna see commercial first naturally with the cost of, what's, of the components that go into that vehicle. Um, for someone to be able to get to, unless someone wants to just have one of those, you know, supercars for themselves, they'll always be that enthusiast group. But I think you're going to see commercial. You're going to see you're going to see trucks. You're going to see things on the long haul um, before the short haul. Um, again, kind of that very you know fine tune or, or that that last that last mile or two for integration first to really demonstrate it. Um, but I don't think it's. I think that um, from a commercial from a passenger vehicle perspective, I mean, I would think that you're gonna have opportunities to buy them in the next five to six years. Part of the challenge is that it's gonna, but I will say, I think it's going to take 20 or 30 years before we're all allowed not to drive anymore. Um, I do believe that is gonna happen where the human driver is is uh, is less safe than, than the machine. It will take a long time to get there, but um, it'll be really interesting to see if my boys um, ever really drive. 
We'll be watching these human drivers on Twitch and betting on <laughs> exactly the, on the and, and their virtual experiences. Yeah. yeah. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank uh, you. It was a real pleasure to be here.